Previously on The Grand Sophie, Charles's fiancée, Miss Eugenia Raxton, attempted to challenge Sophie's unconventional attitude to life. But she received short shrift and some bad behaviour from our exuberant heroine in her new high-perch phaeton. I have been so upset by Sophie's behaviour that I have taken myself off to my sister's to avoid the mortification of staying in town. Charles's abominable cousin drove me down St. James's in the plain sight of all of the clubs and everyone saw me because I did not even have a veil with which to cover my features. I wish to alight instantly. And walk unattended along Piccadilly? You cannot mean it. Stop! Charles has been horrible towards me despite how upset I was. I wish never to see Sophie again. Eugenia's absence, lying low at her sister's house, in the opinion of the younger members of the Rivenhall family, was a relief for which they felt nothing but gratitude. They spent their time teasing Sophie over the attentions paid to her by the stolid and florid Lord Bromford, who danced with her once at Almax and decided she'd be just the wife for him. Did I tell you, Miss Stanton Lacey, about my time in Jamaica? Indeed, Lord Bromford. You have told me so much about it. I confess it is beginning to lose its fascination. You do know, of course, I was sent there for the sake of my health. I am particularly susceptible to ailments that the doctors have no name for, let alone a cure. In that case, I am surprised you brave the dangers of Berkeley Square with such frequency. Ah, I brave them in order to see you, Miss Stanton Lacey, in the hope that you will one day return the regard I have for you. I fear, Lord Bromford, that day is a long way off. I shall persevere. Do you ride in the park tomorrow? I have not yet made my plans for tomorrow. I shall be there at the usual time. You may depend on me, Miss Stanton Lacey. I'm sure I may, Lord Bromford. I'm sure I may. Perhaps it was to escape Lord Bromford that Sophie arranged a trip to Merton to visit the exotic Marquesa da Villacanas, who was supposedly engaged to Sophie's father, Sir Horace Stanton Lacey. Eugenia returned from her self-imposed exile to join them on this expedition. And they were about to set off from Barclay Square when Augustus Fornhope, with whom Charles's young and beautiful sister Cecilia fancied herself in love, appeared and at once proposed to join them. I had no notion when I got up this morning what I wished to do, but now I know. I will go with you to romantic Merton. My dear Mr. Fornhope, you cannot mean it. I would love it if Augustus accompanied us, Mama. Yes, but Charles... Is this your doing, Cousin Sophie? Did you invite that abominable puppy, as well as that fellow Talgarth? I assure you, Cousin Charles, that I did not. I, with my fair Cecilia, to Merton now will go, where softly flows the wandle and... and daffodils that blow. What an ugly word wandle is. Why do you frown at me, Lady Ombersley? May I not go with you? I'm sure we should be pleased to take you, Augustus, but we're going to visit the Marquesa de Villacanas, and she won't be expecting you. Now there is a beautiful name, Villa Canyas, a Spanish lady, with garments gay and rich as may be, decked with jewels had she on. Oh, Augustus, how beautiful. He's the most abominable poet. I agree with you, but he is incredibly good looking. How can you tolerate such a fellow? Come, don't let's talk of him. I have sworn not to quarrel with you today. You amaze me. I trust it is because Eugenia has generously decided to forgive you? Don't be such an ape. I want to drive your greys, of course. Oh, that. When we're clear of the town, you shall do so. That is a remark calculated to make me lose my temper. I shall not do so, however. I'm not saying I doubt your skill. A handsome admission, which cost you an effort to make. That makes it all the more valuable. But your English roads are so much better than the ones in Spain that not much skill is required. Now you're trying to provoke me, Sophie. As if I would ever do such a thing. Can we go a little faster now we're free of those narrow streets? We can, and I shall hand you the reins once we've overtaken the landolet. Which was the small four-wheeled carriage in which Lady Ombersley, Cecilia, Eugenia and Augustus were travelling. Eugenia and Augustus were discussing Dante's Inferno, and Cecilia was bored. Though her handsome poet was either ignorant of the fact or indifferent to it. You can take the reins now, Sophie. I'm glad I'm not in the land of it. Why, Charles? Surely your knowledge of Italian poetry is as good as Mr Fornhope's. I wouldn't demean myself talking to him. You took that bend awfully fast. I thought you wanted to get away from the others. Fornhope and that rakish friend of yours, Talgarth. 
I can't think what you see in either of them. Augustus is very pretty, and Sir Vincent is very amusing. And I'm neither, I suppose. You may suppose what you please, Charles, but you and I have very different tastes. That is very true. Except when it comes to horsemanship. Enough with the horses. We need a change of scene, so let's imagine ourselves arriving at the Merton house procured for the Marchesa by Sophie's father in what was then a fashionable suburban village on the outskirts of London. Picture for yourselves a spacious Palladian villa with lots of columns and arches prettily situated in charming gardens with a bluebell wood attached. Since they'd arrived before the rest of the party, Sophie left Charles to ensure his horses were properly stabled and went to see the Marchesa, who she discovered reclining on a sofa in a sunny drawing room with the blinds half drawn. Sophie immediately flung back the curtains, saying as she did so... Sancha, you can't go to sleep when your visitors are almost at the door. My complexion, Sophie. There is nothing so injurious as sunshine. How often have I said it? Yes, but my aunt will think it quite odd if you lie in darkness and she has to grope her way to you. Do get up. Bien entendido. I will get up when your aunt approaches. If she is at the door, it shall be now. You will help me to rise. The Marchesa was an opulent brunette, wearing a gown of gauze over satin, revealing a good deal more of her shape than Lady Ombersley, let alone Eugenia, was likely to think seemly. Her body, however, was slightly concealed by the shawls and scarves draped around her as protection against the treacherous English drafts. Her luxuriant black locks were covered by a mantilla pinned to her low corsage by a large emerald brooch. More emeralds, massively set in gold, dangled from her earlobes, and her famous pearls were twisted twice around her throat, but still hung almost to her waist. She was a little over 35, but her plumpness made her seem older. She certainly didn't look in the least like a widow, which was the first thought that occurred to Lady Ombersley when she entered and took the languid hand held out to her. Come sta? Sancha, in English. Well, I can speak French and English, and both very well. Also German, but that not so well, yet better than most people. It is a profound happiness to meet the sister of Sir Horace, though you do not, I find, resemble him. Are these then all your sons and daughters? Oh, certainly not. Allow me to introduce my son, Hubert. This is my daughter, Cecilia. Uh, This is Sir Vincent Telgarth. How do you do, ma'am? The Marchesa quickly lost interest while the names of her many guests were being recited, until Sophie reminded her that she'd met Sir Vincent Telgarth before, on a certain evening on the Prado. She did, however, compliment Cecilia on the perfection of her features and Lady Ombersley on her beauty. She smiled kindly at Eugenia and said only that she too was very English. I fear I'm not above the ordinary, but I've been brought up to think beauty is only skin deep. In England, the fashion is for dark women. I am, of course, a great admirer of Don Quixote. All the English are, and they will none of them say the name correctly. In Madrid, when the English army was there, every officer told me he much admired Cervantes. Though mostly it was not true. We also have Montalban and Lope de Vega. El Fénix de España. Sophie, this young man with the face of an angel reads Spanish. Indifferently, I assure you. We will talk together. Certainly not, if you mean to do so in Spanish. Fortunately, the Marchesa's butler announced that refreshments were being laid out in the dining room. Luncheon is served, ma'am. The guests trooped in to partake of a profusion of succulent foreign dishes. This sauce is uh, very interesting. Garnished with aspic, spread with subtle sauces and served with various excellent wines. Jellies. These brandy cherries are absolutely fantastic. Trifles, syllabubs, bowls of fruit and coffee creams in cups of almond paste rounded off what the Marchesa called a light repast. Only Miss Raxton, Eugenia, held back. Vulgar to eat so much at luncheon, Hubert. I disagree. The Marchesa herself consumed so many coffee creams, Italian biscuits and brandy cherries. It is so hard to find delicious almond paste away from Madrid. That the young Rivenhalls regarded her with respect, bordering on awe. 
So, Signora Ombersley, I'm sure the young people would like to wander through a very pretty bluebell wood while you and I repose ourselves a little. Though it would never have occurred to Lady Ombersley to suggest a siesta to a visitor, as she invariably dozed during the afternoon, she had no fault to find with this programme. While the rest of the party wandered out into the gardens, the two older ladies returned to the drawing room, where each arranged themselves on a sofa. So you met my brother in Madrid? I did. It is not amusing to be a widow, and I prefer England to Spain since my country is now so impoverished. And you and Horace... Yes? Are you... I mean, do you intend... To marry... He has talked of it, but to be a stepmother to Sophie, no, and a thousand times no. Oh, we are all very fond of my dear niece. I also, but she is too fatiguing. One does not know what next she will do, or, which is worse by far, what she will make one do that one does not wish to do at all. Oh, my dear Marchesa, I'm sure my niece could never persuade you to exert yourself in any way disagreeable to you. It is plain that you do not know Sophie. To withstand her is much, much more fatiguing still. The two ladies did not discuss Sophie for very much longer, as they were both overcome by the need for a postprandial nap. Sophie herself was walking in the Bluebell Wood with Charles's younger brother, Hubert, whose moods she noticed swung from exaggerated high spirits to black depressions. As she could never see someone suffer without inquiring the cause, and if possible, putting it right, she asked if there was anything troubling him. Troubled? Is that what I look like? Dear Hubert, I wouldn't have asked if I didn't think something was up. Don't get on your high horse. Tell me, and perhaps I can help. Well, well, I have been a trifle worried. But it's no great matter, and I expect to put it all behind me very shortly. Let's sit down and talk about it. Come, Hubert, and tell me all. If it is money, and it nearly always is, it's the most odious thing and you do not care to ask your papa, I expect I could assist. My father, he hasn't a feather to fly with. And what's so dashed unjust when you consider his past activities is that the only time I ever applied to him, he went into a worse rage than Charles. Does Charles go into a rage? Well, no, not precisely. But the way he lectures me, I almost wish he did. So you don't want to approach him? Then allow me... Certainly not. Devilish good of you, Sophie, but I haven't come to that yet. Come to what, exactly? Borrowing from females, of course. Besides, there's no need. I shall come about and before I go back up to Oxford, thank the Lord. How? Never mind, but it can't fail. If it does... Uh, but it won't. I may have a father who... Well, no sense in talking of him. And I may have a dashed disagreeable brother who holds tightly to the purse strings, but fortunately for me, I have a couple of good friends, whatever Charles may say. Does he dislike your friends? Lord, yes. Just because they're knowing uns and kick up a lark every now and then, he proses like a Methodist. But here, Sophie, you won't go talking to him now, will you? Of course I shan't. What a creature you must think me. No, I don't. Only, well, it don't signify. I shall be as merry as a grig in a week's time, and I don't mean to get into a fix again, I can tell you. Meanwhile, Augustus and Cecilia were walking hand in hand, closely chaperoned by Eugenia and accompanied by Sir Vincent Talgarth. Augustus was inspired, but so far had managed only one line. When amidst bluebells my Cecilia treads. Isn't there a poem by Cooper about bluebells, Mr. Fallhope? Oh, you know Cooper's work, Miss Braxton. Eugenia thus succeeded in diverting Augustus's attention from Cecilia to herself, which gave Sir Vincent Talgarth, who was almost as bored as Cecilia, the opportunity to detach her from her poetical swain. Profound though my admiration is for Miss Braxton's intellect, I do find her conversation... Oppressive, don't you, Miss Rivenhall? No one but you and my cousin Sophie would dare say as much. To be honest, I find woods and blue stockings have a lowering effect on my spirits. Are you the same? I fear I am, Sir Vincent. Then, as the ground is too damp to make it fit for a walk by a delicate... I am not that delicate. I was going to say a delicate and beautiful young lady. <laughs> I suggest we visit the dovecot, where at least there will be solid ground beneath our feet. Will you accompany me? Will Mama approve? I believe she and the Marquesa are asleep. Would Eugenia approve? Do you want to ask her? Uh, certainly not. 
Let us go. While Eugenia and Augustus were left in the wood to argue over the merits of the metaphysical poets, and with Cecilia engaged in harmless dalliance with Sir Vincent, Sophie went back towards the house where she found Charles seated under an elm tree with her dog, Tina, who was sleeping off a large meal. If you want to see a rare sight, Sophie, you peep in at the drawing room window. My mother is sound asleep on one sofa and the Marquesa on another. Well, if that is their notion of enjoyment, I don't think we should disturb them. May I join you? Plenty of room. Thank you. I don't care for an afternoon nap, but I do try to remember that some people like to spend half their days doing nothing at all. No one could call you idle, though I sometimes wonder if it wouldn't be better for the rest of us if you were. Charles! As we've agreed not to quarrel today, I won't pursue that thought. Uh, Tell me, though, what is your uncle about to be marrying that woman? She is very good-natured, you know. And Sir Horace says he likes restful women. As a surprise? Charles. All I meant is that I'm surprised you have sanctioned so unsuitable a match. That's not what you meant at all. And besides, I have no say in the matter. Don't play the innocent with me, cousin. I know you well enough to be certain you rule my uncle with a rod of iron. I'm sure you've guarded him from dozens of Marquesas in your time. Well, yes. But then none of them would have made the poor angel as comfortable as I think Sancho may. I'm determined he should marry again. Are you saying this match is of your making? Certainly not. There's never any need to make matches for Sir Horace. He's the most susceptible creature imaginable. A pretty woman only has to cry on his shoulder and he'll do anything she wants. Charles was about to reply when he noticed his sister Cecilia come into view, accompanied by Sir Vincent. He frowned, which prompted Sophie to say severely, Now, don't take one of your pets just because Ceci flirts a little with Sir Vincent. You should be thankful to see her taking an interest in someone other than Mr Fornhope, but there's no pleasing you. I'm certainly not pleased with that connection. There is no cause for alarm. Sir Vincent is only interested in heiresses. It isn't Sir Vincent who concerns me. This conversation was interrupted by a tap on the window from the Marchesa, who beckoned them all inside. She was so much refreshed by her nap that she appeared quite animated. She and Lady Ombersley had thoroughly discussed various recipes for preserving the complexion, including raw veal, laid on the face at night to remove wrinkles, and they were agreed on the benefits of chervil water and distilled strawberries, all of which had given the Marchesa an appetite, as it had been at least two hours since their previous repast. I beg you will join me in taking tea and angel cakes. Oh, rather. Hubert, you ate so many cakes at luncheon. That was hours ago. And don't tell me you haven't worked up an appetite gallivanting with Sir Vincent. I was not gallivanting. He got someone to bring us some maize and the pigeons were pecking it from my lips. How disgusting. That'll do, you two. Where's Eugenia? And Mr. Fornhope. I've no doubt Augustus and Eugenia are quoting poetry at one another in the wood. On their own? (laughs) You may be sure, Mama, that Eugenia would not permit any impropriety. You dreadful boy. What have you done? Only lock them in the wood. That'll teach her. It will not do. Give me the key to the gate and don't let anyone see. Spoil sport. Here you are. It's so unlike Eugenia. I can't think what they could be about. It is for sure not difficult to imagine. With so beautiful a young man in so romantic a play. I'll go and look for them. I wonder if one of the gardeners might have locked the gate, thinking we'd all left the wood. Uh, Excuse me. Charles, wait for me. If I must. So stupid. Sancha lives in dread of robbers and insists the servants never leave a door or a gate unlocked. One of them, assuming we had all returned to the house, locked the gate and gave the key to the butler. Here it is. And there is Eugenia, not looking at all pleased. Oh dear. But Mr Fornhope seems quite at ease sitting on that bank. No doubt he is composing some epic poem. No doubt. Eugenia, I have the key. I am so sorry, Miss Raxton. It's all the fault of Sancha's absurd terrors. Are you very bored and chilled? You did this! No, I assure you. Uh, Did you not shout for assistance? A lady does not shout, Charles. I asked Mr Fornhope if he could climb over the fence, and he said he couldn't. That doesn't surprise me. Then I asked him to shout, but he said he was inspired by the setting, took out his notebook and pencil, sat himself down, and told me to hush, Charles. I'm not accustomed to being spoken to in such a fashion. Never mind. Come and drink some of Sancha's excellent tea. This was all you're doing, Miss Stanton Lacey. You are unprincipled and vulgar and... Eugenia! (laughs) 
I will go and rouse Mr. Fawnhope. Excuse me. It was nothing but an accident, Eugenia. It was no such thing. There's no need to be so put out. When your cousin did it to make me a laughing stock? Nonsense. I need hardly tell you that my sole aim was to prevent your sister spending the entire afternoon in that odious young man's company. With the result that she spent it with Talgarth. There's no reason for you to be so busy, Eugenia. My presence, not to mention my mother's, made your action unnecessary. Let's go in. I cannot believe any of the servants were responsible. I think it would be better if you pretended to believe it. Then you do not think so either. You believe me, Charles. I think Hubert did it. Hubert? Why should he do such an ungentlemanly thing? Perhaps for a jest? Perhaps because he dislikes your interference in Cecy's affairs? He's very much attached to her, you know. If that's so, I trust you will take him to task. I shall do no such thing. If he was responsible, at least you have my cousin to thank for your speedy release. Your cousin Sophie? She was the one who brought me the key. After leaving me there for at least half an hour? She wasn't to blame, I assure you. An apology might be in order. An apology? My dear Charles, if anyone is owed an apology... Let's say no more about it, shall we? Next time on The Grand Sophie, the Ombersley Ball is a great success. Cecy makes a shocking announcement and we meet the dashing Lord Charlbury. For more about the books of Georgette Heyer or to subscribe to the podcast, go to thegrandsophie.co.uk and you can also subscribe on your usual podcast app.